thank Paul and the organizers for inviting me here to ruin the focus of today's conference. Um, whereas Rosalind uh, talks about increasing scalability of bioinformatics learning outside of the classroom, I'm going to be talking about some different ways of trying to improve scalability of bioinformatics teaching in the classroom. So um, I feel that I can only describe my own experience uh, in actually trying to get some of these methods working. Uh, over the last year, I've pretty much devoted all of my time to developing the methods that I'm going to be talking about today. Of course, there's nothing fundamentally novel here. It's just about tools and sharing is really what I'm going to be talking about today. And I've used this now for two courses. One, a bioinformatics, uh, I guess you would say, basic theory course for computer science and bioinformatics students, which is for both graduate students and undergrads, mostly undergrads. And also a bioinformatics for biologists course, um, which is taught within my department, again, mostly for undergrads. Um, I'm within the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry is my primary affiliation, and computer science is a secondary affiliation. So I'll, I'll try to show some examples of the kinds of materials that I'm talking about, mainly focusing on this bioinformatics for biologists uh, problem. So um, just to be completely practical about this, um, everything I'm going to be talking about today is, arises from my own struggles with how to teach to this audience of students. And I'll just pick out an example of a practical problem. Textbooks. There are a lot of textbooks now. When you have to choose one or two for a field like bioinformatics that's so interdisciplinary, it really becomes a challenge. Um, specifically, let's just talk about, say, I, I assign Ewens and Grant as a statistics-focused uh, book and Jones and Pevsner for an algorithms book for undergraduate bioinformatics course. Well, I find, in my personal experience, that this doesn't really work. Now let's focus on the Ewens and Grant side of it. There's uh, material written by, essentially, a statistics professor for statistics students, and then I'm trying to get my CS students or my biology students to learn how to solve real problems using some of those ideas. The exercises, for example, uh, that are supplied in these books are just not adequate for bridging that gap. It's just too big a gap between what the book is really about and the kinds of problems it provides versus the sorts of skills that my students need to learn. The conclusion I draw from this is that this problem fundamentally is too big for any one person and that we need better ways of being able to share and select our teaching materials than simply deciding, okay, whose textbook am I going to assign for this one class? Question. Chris, do you mean that Evans and Grant have too much materials that is outside of typical interest, typical skills and scope of computer science students? Well, um, the problems are typically either, you know, there's some numbers and you do some kind of calculations, plug and chug, or derive some desired expression and um, that's pretty remote. I mean, it's very useful. You've got to have those skills, but it's, it's, there's a whole other level of skills for taking a, a real-world problem, figuring out how to model it, how to walk through the steps of using the concepts to solve the problem, and those are not represented in the exercises. I can't rely upon the set of exercises that are provided in that book to have the students exit the class knowing how to do the things that they're going to need to know how to do. Simple as that. So um, I want to connect this back to a related, what I would call rude awakening in US um, science teaching in the field of physics, where the development of a relatively good test for conceptual understanding of basic undergrad physics basically showed that US uh, College courses, even say at Harvard, are failing to impart uh, adequate conceptual understanding. So this is essentially a set of questions that any physics professor looks at the question and says, oh, the answer is obvious. You give it to the students, and what you find is that they've learned how to uh, work through, in some cases, fairly complicated mathematical derivations and uh, algorithms, if you will, for solving problems. 
um, but they actually don't understand the basic concepts in a, in a solid way. And Eric Mazur at Harvard um, has written uh, quite a bit about this. Um, I won't go into that. I'll just show an example of how I try to apply this to bioinformatics for biology uh, teaching. So there are a number of issues such as false positives, uh, hidden versus observable variables, conditional probability, and the inequality of converses that arise whenever a biologist tries to understand some data set that is got uh, large numbers in it, as we typically have in genomics and bioinformatics. And this is a very, very simple question that doesn't require any computation. Um, you can basically just look at the number and say, oh, 97%, so that leaves 3% versus um, true positives only left is got to be less than 1%, so the true positives are going to be a small fraction of the total positives obtained from this. So right away, you know that this test's reliability is going to be quite different based upon uh, the observable, whether it's positive test result versus negative test result. If you understand basic principle of conditional probability, you're listening to the question that's being asked about, given what you actually see, now interpret the hidden variable, um, then this is a very easy question. But what it does when you pose it to a set of bioinformatics for biology students in class is it quickly reveals that they don't get many of those basic pieces. And by showing them that they're not getting it, you then have a chance to work through them uh, very carefully through each of those pieces. So. Um, the basic methodology that I'm using is this is a completely ungraded learning exercise presented uh, as a question in class. They use their smartphones and laptops to answer the question. They only get one minute to think about the question. You don't want them you know, trying to solve equations or, or just doing it mechanically through the math. I want them to be thinking about the principles involved. And um, then there's a peer instruction component where they're paired off with the person sitting next to them, and each person tries to convince the other person that their answer is right and why. And then, um, uh, having entered their information um, into the online server, then they see the answer, I see all of their answers, and I give them a lot of feedback about lessons learned. And this cycle might take 10 or 15 minutes uh, Total class time might be split over more than one class. In other words, I might come back to the next class and give them lessons learned on um, what I saw in their responses from the previous uh, class response. Um, I find that this really improves the student engagement. I'm literally getting five times more questions in class, just random people raising their hand and asking questions as, as opposed to what I had before. My students' scores are going up quite significantly relative to previous years, and um, the students are actually enjoying it. They're, they enjoy talking about the material in class through this, the, the peer instruction component. Um, I feel that this addresses a basic gap in how we teach, namely that when we lecture and when we write textbooks, we essentially explain the right answer. And what I feel that students need, actually, is to see all the ways you can go wrong. And specifically, that you know, when someone hears an idea, says, oh, that sounds sensible, that, that, that's good, I understand that. But then you go out into the world, there's many ways you could try to use it, some of which are right and some of which are wrong. And I feel that when I watch students, what I see is that um, they go forth and they misuse the ideas. Um, unless you know, number one, which ways are right and which ways are wrong, and secondly, that you can explain from first principles why the wrong ways are wrong, oftentimes by giving an example that makes it um, completely convincing that, that it leads to an absurd result, you don't really understand how to use the idea. So exposing these error models explicitly in class to, to my mind, is an essential piece of, of the learning process. The best students have always been doing this work for themselves um, by 
through their study. But I feel that for the average student, unless you're actually explicitly doing this in class, it doesn't happen for a large fraction of them. So telling the students the answer is not the right way, um, not enough. And um, I'm capturing all this data essentially as metadata. What are the error models that come up most frequently in the student responses now becomes part of the database that is uh, used in generating the questions and giving them um, uh, choices for self-evaluation in, in the future. Um, another simple example designed to probe um, a biologist's understanding of additive versus um, ultrametric distances in, in phylogeny. Give them a simple example where, um, let's say, that uh, the distance from uh, sequence C to sequence A versus C to sequence B is less than the distance between the sequences A and B that are uh, paired in this tree as uh, direct neighbors. And probe whether the students really understand the meaning of uh, the tree structure. And um, based upon the kinds of responses that I'm getting, then now I can classify the exact kinds of errors that the students are making and give them very explicit feedback about actually what each individual person, how they're going wrong. I mean, even if only one person makes a mistake, I'm going to directly address that error in um, my analysis and, and presentation to them uh, in the next class. Question. Sorry. So in this particular example, uh, how deeply would you go into this? Would you go to demonstrate that a more naive approach that neighbor joining would make a mistake? Or would you go to demonstrate that neighbor joining actually will find correct pair of leaves? Yeah, exactly. So um, I, here I'm only showing my uh, lessons learned slide. After I present the question, of course, there's an answer slide and quite a bit of analysis talking about the meaning of this, this question. Um, absolutely. So this, is this is just a little snippet of, this is a, I'm just, I'm illustrating how I follow up with the kinds of errors that I see from the students. Okay. So um, the methodology that I'm referring to here is called by Eric Mazur concept testing. The idea is that each concept test focuses on a single concept that it explicitly is designed to avoid mechanics. Don't give them enough time to try to solve it by just mechanically working out equations. Instead, they have to think about the, the basic principles that are involved in order to be able to, to answer the question. Um, a common question that I get from both the CS students and from the biology students, why are you asking us questions that you haven't already shown us how to answer? Um, I think this is actually a great definition of the methodology. In other words, a good concept test is a question that is conditionally independent of the training, uh, given the concept that I'm trying to teach. If the concept were something that were really, you know, an exact sequence of, to be memorized, then I suppose, you know, the concept test would still be asking about those exact memorization details. But in general, um, if, you know, I'm telling them something explicit and then asking them to give it back to me, um, I feel I'm testing memory rather than understanding. Um, I target usually a 40 to 80% correct answer rate to make this neither trivial nor impossible so that kind of maximum learning occurs in class. Um, one minor twiddle of this is that this is not new. Uh, Eric Mazur and many others have been pushing this for you know, something like 15 years, and it's spreading, at least in the U.S., only very slowly. And I think the reason for this is that um, the concept testing methodology that they have pushed has been strictly multiple choice, partly because they use these quickers in class, um, and also, you know, if you're trying to score, I guess, you know, having multiple choice eliminates ambiguity of scoring. But writing decent multiple choice concept tests is really, really, really hard. Um, you essentially have to already know what all of the error models are for the students, and then you explicitly code each of your multiple choices, sort of, you know, appeals to one of those specific error models. So 
In short, what I do is I simply use open response for most of the concept testing that, that I do. You can type equations, text on their laptop or smartphone, and that's what I'm capturing. The key is that you can see how they're thinking. So you can understand, you could collect data on new error models directly through this process, whereas if you were doing multiple choice, you wouldn't really learn much of anything new about error models. And this, in my view, makes the whole idea of concept testing quite easy and scalable. Um, basically, almost any kind of simple application problem that you can pose um, that's sort of focused enough can become a good concept test because it will just expose the error models that the students are, are falling into. Um, of course, this is new for the students. And there is a common pattern, at least in the US, of you know, constant pressure for you know, nothing that you ask us, especially on exams, should have any quote unquote ambiguity. You have to tell me exactly what to assume, or you know, that's not fair. Um, and all I have to, should have to do is then solve you know, the associated equations, which has a strong tendency, at least in, in science teaching, as opposed to mathematics teaching, to eliminate all the scientific content from the question and leave nothing left to solve but uh, some algebra. Um, the concept testing really is sort of you know, the antichrist uh, with respect to this set of expectations from the students. I mean, they, I find, come in with the expectation that you know, a good class is one that sort of repeats a set of standard list of, of question types and solutions to saturation. So you can just memorize how to do that particular algorithm for that particular problem. Um, concept testing, obviously, is, is the antithesis of that, constantly asking them questions that they have not been shown the answer to. The memorization habit dies hard. So uh, I just wanted to better understand the structure of the lecture. So the first 10 minutes, you do concept testing, and then there is traditional lecture. Well, how much time? Testing. You can do it several ways. I've done it one way where there's reading assigned, absolutely required, teaches the, the basic definitions and concepts, and then the class is mostly concept testing with lots and lots of slides after each concept test, really going into the consequences and meaning of the concept that was being probed. Um, a second model is where essentially it's half lecture and half concept testing, so the reading basically becomes lecture. Um, the students are, I would say, much more comfortable with the second. It feels much more like what they're used to, regular class. Um, and the other thing I should mention is that I'm doing this with a two-hour time slot for every class. And I think that's pretty important with the concept testing because, you know, there's time involved in they have to get their laptops out and get connected to the network and blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, I mean, I guess it's sort of obvious that, that we're working against the memorization um, uh, pattern. And just as a simple example of what I s see among my students, I don't know if this would occur here, but um, you know, I asked a question that uh, addresses uh, kind of a forensic test for whether two women are actually sisters or not. And they have to draw a graph structure for the variables that they would propose for uh, the probabilistic modeling of this problem. And uh, some of the students handed me back an answer that I just could not understand where it could possibly have come from. Because basically, if you, if you look at this model, they're, they're kind of modeling it as if you know, the two samples taken from the two women are dependent upon a single variable, as if you know, the genetics of the two women are identical. And then I realized, well, wait a second. This is, was the answer from one of the homework questions that we had. Um, so basically, they just remembered, oh, on a previous problem that was sort of like this problem, this was the answer, so I'm going to write that down, as opposed to thinking about what they were being asked on this question. Um, there are various things that I do to try to win the students' support over to this methodology. Um, and uh, I guess... Uh, the fact that it's ungraded, the fact that it's about helping them learn, that it gives them a lot of feedback, um, and that you know it, it becomes part of a, of a, 
a real pattern of, of just a lot of questions and answers going back and forth between them. I also try to encourage them to uh, help each other by grading on last year's curve rather than uh, on the current year's curve. So basically, if they can learn more this year than we learned last year, then I'll get better grades. Um, there's a split that occurs in teaching in this methodology where um, the lecturing before concept tests really focuses pretty strictly just on defining concepts and, and vocabulary um, rather than trying to draw every kind of consequence from them and instead the concept testing itself and the slides that follow the concept tests really draw out more of the consequences and subtleties um, where I'm actually seeing whether the students can start to see some of the implications of the basic definitions that they're, they're being given. Okay, so how does this connect to Rosalind? Critical question for this talk. Um, both of these methodologies are about moving away from what you might call a passive consumer model of, of teaching to challenging students with problems. And um, I think they complement each other. That is to say that um, you could say that, that a process like Rosalind essentially forces students to try to master a particular concept. And the readout that you get and can automatically score in Rosalind is you know, whether they've empirically demonstrated mastery of the concept that's required for that problem. Of course, the question is, how are students actually going to gain that mastery in the first place if they simply lacked a number of concepts that were required for a particular Rosalind problem? You know, how should they learn them? I guess what I'm trying to suggest is that as a Socratic method in, in the classroom or even outside the classroom can be thought of as sort of the training phase and Rosalind could be sort of thought of as the test phase, which of course itself can, can drive the training process. Um, what I propose uh, is that we need to share materials in the same way that uh, Rosalind is essentially sort of open sourcing the, the set of, of problems for people to um, solve. Um, I feel that as an instructor, you know, I'm, at least in the past, constantly reinventing the wheel, as, as you said. Um, and it would be much better if instead I could focus on you know, the kinds of problems where I have expertise and draw on problems from other people to use as, as concept tests. So the pattern of the concept testing approach that I'm, I'm talking about here, um, I think has the potential to give sort of best of both worlds. That is to say, where each individual contributes the best of their expertise, but at the same time um, can have total autonomy in choosing what they're actually going to select for their teaching. This is not teaching by committee, but simply a way of eliminating barriers, artificial barriers to sharing and reuse of teaching materials. So the kinds of materials that at least I am throwing into the pot here Basically, everything that I've generated over uh, the years from, from my own teaching in a variety of, of categories, the concept tests themselves, uh, a bunch of textbook materials, slide materials, um, various kinds of projects and, and, and problems that I use on, on my homework, um, and also some software tools that I'll describe in a moment for basically being able to do this automatically in class. The kinds of topics that um, I've covered in the Bioinformatics for Biologists course and the theory course are shown here. This is obviously not going to be, uh, you know, in any sense complete, um, but simply what I have focused on in these particular classes. So this is what's already in the pot. And um, what I would propose is that this is something that should be shared through, you know, sort of a distributed version control. That is to say, everybody has a complete copy of the total repository, can use the materials however they like, make changes however they like, and then decide however they like what they want to contribute back to the community repository. Um, when and what changes you want to contribute back. Under the kinds of tools like 
Git distributed version control that, that I'm using, merges of different people's contributions would be completely automatic, and credit would be completely automatically tracked as well. It's just, that's what distributed version control does. Um, there are, of course, issues about uh, sharing of materials that could be used for graded um, testing. Um, and I guess what I would propose is that, of course, most of the materials would be publicly accessible, and I've made most of my materials already publicly accessible, but that contributors would have the option to specify what level of security they would want for specific questions. For example, to mark something as final exam only, no, no distribution of either the question or the answers, um, or limited distribution where, for example, only enrolled students would be allowed to see questions and answers, um, et cetera. So uh, a little bit about tools and format of what I've, I've done uh, so far with this. Um, in general, I try to go with the simplest possible formats that can really be um, uh, managed very easily under tools like distributed version control. So basically just flat text. Um, I find this is, is far easier than other formats like binary formats or Microsoft Word or what have you. Um, although obviously all these things are interconvertible, so you know it's not not a big issue, but I will talk a little bit about specifically how I've been doing things in case it's useful for other people. Um, I tend to use a completely trivial uh, flat text format uh, that's used for documentation, standard format called restructured text. It supports LaTeX equations, BibTeX bibliographies, etc. Recompilable to pretty much any of the standard output targets that you might want, such as LaTeX, PDF, standard HTML, um, slides generated, for example, via Beamer, um, blog pages like WordPress or Blogger, these are all completely automatic conversions. And at least for me, the way I found myself using it, essentially for all of my work, such as papers, slides, teaching materials, textbook, uh, et, et cetera, um, it's essentially like using LaTeX without a lot of the boilerplate that you constantly find yourself typing the same, you know, opening brace over and over again. Um, but of course, that is something that is up to the individual, exactly what you want to use. This is what restructured text actually looks like. Um, to generate the, a, a slide, I would you know, just put a little title, and bullet points, equations, what have you. Um, I've extended this a bit to what I would call reusable text by using restructured text um, metadata definition to be able to tag and block um, different pieces of the text, essentially annotating what the text actually is. Obviously, you could do this with XML or JSON or any other set of, of formats, but I find it very useful to strip with just a uh, no boilerplate plain text, and then to use a preprocessor for being able to automatically select out what bits out of my essentially database of textbook materials I want to inject into a particular output. So I'm producing a lecture for today. OK, what materials do I want to pull from all sorts of different places and produce that list of, of um, IDs, generate the, the output, produce an answer key, produce an exam, just by selecting which specific problems and output format I want. Basically, treat your text as a database. And so I'm using a very simple format. It's reusable text. It's essentially adding uh, these metadata tags to be able to um, annotate what the content is. So if I have a question, it's got an associated answer. It's got uh, concept ID annotation of what concept is being tested, etc. cetera. Um, I should mention that in the tagging of concept IDs on this material, I found that I could pretty much use Wikipedia uh, IDs. I could find a one-to-one -one match for many, if not all, of uh, the concepts that I was uh, teaching. And so I used Wikipedia IDs as the uh, concept IDs throughout. 
And then I annotate the different types of relations for each piece of text. What is it doing? Is it saying, okay, now we're deriving this concept from that concept as, as a starting assumption, or I'm using this piece of text to motivate the next concept that I'm going to teach, etc. cetera. Um, and so what you can get out of this is with the automatic analysis, um, here just showing a little snippet of the concept graph extracted from um, my set of materials where the different relations here, for example, you know, here's a particular problem that's testing uh, understanding of this uh, concept, um, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, different people's textbooks then would just be different traversals over the same framework of concept IDs uh, in Wikipedia. And so, um, in any kind of online display of this kind of material, you could um, basically, if you don't like my presentation of a concept, you flip over and say, well, how does Wikipedia explain this idea? How does somebody else explain this idea? Um, for the in-class question system, I found the need to experiment quite a bit because I wanted open response, I wanted LaTeX equation support, etc. So I uh, simply developed a fast, lightweight uh, web server um, that I just run on the laptop in class so the students are all connecting to my laptop to connect with their, their uh, smartphone or, or laptop. And this was really designed to give me total control in real time of exactly how I'm going to show things, what I'm going to show, what I'm going to skip. Oh, I'm running out of time. I better jump quick to the next question, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so uh, I had to, I looked around at what was available and, and nothing would give me this, this set of combinations. So this is something I'm also uh, released as, as an open source tool in case it's useful for people. Um, this is, in a sense, about scalability, right? It's about, well, can you actually have 50 students in a class, or 100 students in a class, or 200 students in a class, all answering questions, you know, every question that, that you want to pose them, and see all of their answers, see the kinds of errors that they're making, um, and make that actually a scalable process. What I've done so far is sort of, you know, an initial step towards that. I've already used this with classes up to 50 students and gotten that to be completely smooth. I feel that this is something that actually can work. Um, to connect this kind of stuff with Rosalind, um, it seems that you know, if we just use the same concept IDs um, to interconnect them, a lot of interesting uh, connections would, would be possible. Um, because the question that I want to ask is whether this is something that could be useful as an online approach, just as, as Rosalind has. Um, the, the way in which this is being done, there's no actual reason why students have to be in the same room or even at the same time to use this. So, for example, you could imagine a student viewing materials online, either as video, a presentation of a particular concept, or uh, the reading materials that are generated from, from this, et cetera, but you know, all this can be done online. They can do, uh, obviously, the, the concept tests online. They can do the peer instruction online by interacting with essentially virtual um, uh, classmates whose answers are already stored in the database. So you know, a student, new student can write their argument for why they think their answer is right, and then they can see somebody else's argument for why they think their answer was right, and maybe give a different answer, see if that affects their own thoughts on, on the subject, and uh, self-evaluate um, against both the correct answer and the set of all the error models that have already been collected, so you can immediately categorize their error and then go more deeply into exactly why that's an error. Um, the system could automatically regress students if they're uh, not doing very well with the set of concepts that they're trying out initially. You could move them to um, more basic concepts that they don't seem to have uh, solidly. And I guess what I would say is I view all of this strictly as a training, a learning tool. This is, there's no aspect of this that in any way captures how you would grade or test students, which I would just propose should be a separate process. Rosalind actually seems like a good way to do that. Um, so in terms of how people might want to try this out, this could range anywhere from simply um, 
grabbing some of the materials, even just as PDF, if, if you want to avoid dealing with uh, some of the, the tools. Or alternatively, if you want to use tools like restructured text or reusable text to actually generate materials in a flexible way, to use concept testing in class um, would be kind of another level, actually using um, the in-class uh, question system uh, would be one way of, of doing that. Um, and I guess sort of the, the highest level that someone might jump into this would be actually contributing back their own materials to a, a, a sharing consortium. Um, I want to end by just posing this as a set of questions for how this should go forward, whether this is something that actually seems useful for the field, whether there's anything critical missing from this in, in terms of uh, something that lots of teachers and students could use. Um, I'm curious to see whether people here actually would want to use uh, any of these materials or tools, um, and also what fraction of people think they might possibly contribute back to such an effort. Um, another critical question, I feel, is what's the best model for how to use this? I mean, I've been using this essentially as software, you know, run it on my own laptop, et cetera, et cetera. It might be a lot more convenient, actually, as a service where, you know, there's just a website and if your classroom is wired for the internet, your students could just directly connect to the existing um, service without you having to implement uh, and run any software. Um, obvious question is, you know, what, if anything, should be done to, on, on either side to integrate this with, with Rosalind. Uh, that, that could be very interesting. Um, I should confess that this so far, as uh, much as I would like to show us like with lots of people's faces, has been just a one-man effort. I mean, I've just been hacking away and uh, there's lots of deficiencies, obviously, associated with a one-man effort. This is not sustainable, um, something that can only really uh, go anywhere interesting if other people um, choose to get involved. Um, as a follow-up, um, I'll just mention that um, there's a URL here for actually going and looking at the, the initial public release of materials. Um, make comments or discuss what you, you think about any of this. Um, I also uh, can give password for full material access, including all the graded materials and solutions. Um, or if you prefer to access using distributed version control, access the full Git repository, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So um, I am very, very eager to work with other people on this in whatever way other people would say is the, the right way to do this. Um, and I will just end there and uh, hope that lots of conversation can ensue. So um, what I found in my first year of doing this was it was best to do that offline. Yes. So everything's going into a database. There's a, re a report function that will just generate you know, a nice printout of all of their sort of sorted responses or somewhat classified by their own self-evaluation. There's a self-evaluation phase where the students self-score against the answer that I show them. And um, then you know, to the extent that you code those error models now as metadata that goes back into the database. In future years, when you're using the same questions, it can be a lot smoother. Because in the self-evaluation phase now, the students have the choices of the common kinds of errors that have been made in the past. And they can just say, oh, I made that error. right? And then maybe only 20% of your students are making you know, original, truly original errors. Um, would require you know, a lot of separate analysis. So in that case, it becomes possible to do a lot more in class. Again, that's why I ended up experimenting with my own in-class uh, question system, because 
I wanted to experiment with lots of different ways of trying to run it in real time. So in, I originally started out with a whole uh, self-clustering self stage where after the students put in their, their responses, then I would, I would basically say, okay, you know, here are five distinct responses, and we mark those out, and then the students pick, you know, do, does my answer ma essentially match any of these? So we go through like a cycle of self-classification, but I found it, you know, slowed things down. So I ended up doing all the analysis offline, and then coming back next class with lessons learned. Other questions? Uh, are your uh, slides for this talk available? Sure, sure. And this is all generated using the same tools, so yeah. it all looks very generic, but uh, at least it, I, I eat my own dog food. I have a question. So at the uh, last uh, Bioinformatics Education Conference, we have a presentation by Beth Simon, who is one of the leading proponents of active learning in computer science. And according to Bess, if you lecture in your classroom, you are doing something wrong. The only thing classroom is designed for is for something like you described. Interactions with the student, getting their feedback, detecting the errors, making them to talk to each other. So this is kind of extreme. You seem to be somewhere in the middle, right? But I tried both. Would you move completely, like, if you trust the student, that all the concepts in your class should be taken from the books. And the class is only for work of professor who is the students, learning what mistakes they make, giving feedback on the mistake, and making students to interact. Uh, so what's wrong with that? Like, I, I personally cannot see how this model fully best Simon model, and she has a center, the whole center for active learning. Uh, fully work in complex classes. But in a relatively simple class when students can cover everything from textbook or from web material, uh, maybe it will work. What, what do you say? So I tried both. Mm -hmm. so the first time I did it, I pushed the you know, two hours of concept testing model. And in the bioinformatics for biologist class, I did approximately an hour of lecture and an hour of, of concept testing. Um, I feel that it's a practical problem of climbing the slope of students' expectations. What are they expecting to do in class? And um, the difficulty with the, the pure concept test model is that it does not work unless the students really do the reading. And the only way to make that happen if they're not used to, you know, showing up every single day with all the concepts you know, fully, they, you know, they've just done the reading and they're ready to go. Um, but you can you have to, by quizzes. You have, to, you have to do quizzes, that's exactly right. And um, it's a trade-off. You end up spending class time on, on, on quizzes instead of lecturing. Uh, you know, I'm not completely sure that uh, it's worth it. Um, I think probably next year I'm going to have you know, more lecture um, than, than, than zero, <laughs> put it that way, um, even for the theory course. Um, I think right now, you know, students are so used to lecture that it is, you, know, you give them a, a little bit of it, it makes them so, so much more comfortable with what you're doing that uh, it, it's, it's worth it. Other questions? Um. Uh, do you um, treat all uh, your students the same? I mean that uh, if students performs better, he can uh, review or help more students than uh, one to one peer review, for example. Uh, do you use this information in your class? I haven't yet, and that's an entire dimension that um, could really, really be improved. I mean, I personally think that. Um, one of the most critical dimensions of learning is teaching, right? That everybody should be both a student and a teacher um, just on the things that you, 
you know, understand a bit better than someone else, then now you're the teacher, right? So um, peer instruction gets you a little bit of that because if you have two students sitting together and one you know, doesn't understand the concept and one does, then it's gonna automatically go that way. There's nothing explicit in what I'm doing here to like, you know, analyze the patterns of, of the student responses and identify the people who you know, do better and to use them in different ways, but certainly you could. And I think particularly if you go to an online model, then there's all sorts of interesting things that you would, you would want to do that way. Yeah, yeah, no, I really think that that's the way to go, absolutely. That's a lot of, a lot of interesting possibilities there. Other questions? Well, first of all, I really, really talk, thank you. I also like this slide where Monty, the Monty Hall problem is the root of all concepts, which I really appreciate because I totally agree with that. I don't know if that was intentional or not. I just want to follow up on what Papa said because I agree, and I think Beth Simon does wonderful work. But the one thing that that work omits is the most important purpose of the lecture, which is not to convey information, but to signal your human interest in the students in front of you. And I think that's what ultimately is missing if you were to go to a pure peer led group. You need to signal that. It's the preparation time and the emotion you put into that lecture part, even though you're trying to convey information. That's what they pull away, and then they're willing to engage with whatever concept left for you made. That's my experience. With their days. I really love the idea of building this around those, but you're never going to get away with less than 50% lecture. At least mean, not for an ideal response from the students, which is no doubt what you want. Um, but what really struck me here was you built your own web server to sort of ratchet up the amount of interaction in class because the, the tools available weren't enough. My, my yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I felt the need to experiment, and the uh, only way I could do that really, was... Yeah, that's a really interesting idea. Did you say you don't actually take the 50 or 100 or 200 responses, and you don't look at those until the next night? I can't imagine how you would. Yeah, um, in class, time is of the essence, and I'm trying to make everything move smoothly. What I found was that the offline analysis was, was, was key, and... You know, I just come back the next next class with lessons learned, and usually that prompts a lot of questions as well, and so on. So. Do the students still remember when you come a week later what was the problem a week before? I find that most, you know, you come a week later, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, one thing I actually think is good about concept testing is that, um, you know, being tested on on something makes it stand out in the memory much brighter than if you are just hearing it. And um, I haven't had that problem. I mean, just I get tons and tons of questions when I come back to lessons learned, um, even if it's, you know, I mean, usually I'm doing something like, you know, Tuesday, Thursday, so Thursday to the next Tuesday, that's, that's not a problem. I want to make a historical remark to your comments that at least 50% in the classroom should be interactions, but should be like professional personality uh, talking to students. Uh, so active learning became popular, I think, in the last 10 years, maybe, and came from physics. But my historical remark, I actually went to high school as a practice active learning in the 1970s. And in my high school, there were hardly any lectures. And then I was, for a short time, I was a high school teacher. And I also didn't give, there was no lectures in this high school, that was school number 57. There was no lectures in this high school. The only thing that in this high school involves, there were three professors, three teachers in the class, 20 students, less than 20 students, and essentially the only thing these people were doing are going through the class and talking to students. This is much more efficient interaction that interaction of a single professor preaching to 20 students. Because the most like pra precious thing is when you make a mistake and somebody explain you exactly the point where you made a mistake. When you stuck somebody and somebody gives you a hint exactly on the back. So, but to run this type of operations, you need a specially talented student or you need to have a very shallow course. Right? Where students can cover all material by themselves. 
then they go back after the class and they read them. That's absolutely the direction. I, I certainly agree. I agree with that. And I, the, what you're describing is a situation in which you had personal contact because you and two other teachers were circulating around the classroom. Scaling up is the crucial question. It's very hard to scale that up to 200 students. And so, in my opinion, in 2012, the best way to signal that you care about the students is to give a well-prepared, succinct few minutes of lecture in between each of these concept lessons. But only as a proxy, if you had 10 copies of yourself plotted, then you could get away with no lecture. Other questions? Let's sound the speaker again.